Hello, sweet friends, and welcome back to the Quilter's Candy Shop, where you will find sweet treats for the discerning quilter. Well, here we are, week number three of our Winter's Garden Block of the Month. I hope you have your homework done because today we are starting in on block number one. The pattern book we're using is Painter's Garden by Nancy Rink Designs. And the fabric line I'll be demonstrating is Arrival of Winter by Sandy Gervais of Riley Blake. Now it's not too late to join our Winter's Garden block of the month. There's no registration fee. All you have to do is purchase the pattern book so you can have the fabric requirements and the cutting instructions. You can pick up the pattern book and a complete kit if you want to get started right away in our online shop at www.thequilterscandyshop.com. That's S-H-O-P-P-E shop.com. You don't have to use the fabric we're using. You can use your own fabrics and make something uniquely beautiful for you. The first thing we're going to do today is go over how the pattern is structured. It can be a little confusing, so I hope to make things clearer as we go through the pattern together. This is block number one. The instructions for block number one begin on page three of your pattern book. On this page is all the cutting instructions for the piece blocks and part of the instructions for the applique blocks. The good news is there are no errors in the pattern for the first block. The piece blocks here and the applique blocks here are exactly the same around the outside. The only difference is the center like this. The instructions for the center of the applique block is on page five. Now, if you're looking at your pattern book, you've probably noticed that some of the instructions are written in blue ink and some in black ink. If you are making the pieced block, you will cut all the pieces listed regardless if they are black ink or blue ink. If you are making the applique block, you will cut only the pieces in the black ink and then move on to the applique instructions on page five to finish your block. Now, just a couple more details on how to use this pattern, and then we will get on to making our block. The first column is the amount of yardage you will need to make all your cuts. Because this pattern was designed to be used with a block of the month kit, the yardages are listed as fat quarters or fat eighths. You can cut your yardage into the fat quarters or fat eighths and then cut your pieces so you can follow the pattern as written. Or you can custom cut your pieces out of your yardage. It's up to you. The next column details the fabric you will need for the pieces you will cut. Hopefully you have created your fabric chart as we discussed in the week one video. This will be a reference you will use throughout the piecing of your quilt. If you haven't done it, I recommend that you go back and do that before trying to cut the pieces for the quilt. One of the confusing parts of this pattern is having to use the reference chart each time you need to cut a new fabric. The fabric in the pattern is not listed like most patterns, calling for a focus print or a first light or a second light. It has the name and skew of the fabric line used in this pattern. So here's my time-saving tip of the day. At the start of every block, so we're gonna start block number one, Look up the fabric names and numbers listed and then go to your reference chart and determine which of your fabrics are required for each cut and then write the name of that fabric in the box like I did here. For example, this second line here uh, requires a fat eighth of teal droplets and it's number nine seven nine one zero one five four 
Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the fabric I'm using. So by having my fabric chart, I can look up the number they request, 97910154, which is this one, and that's a navy plaid. So I wrote navy plaid in here. Now I won't have to keep looking up that number every time I see it. And I can easily just cut what I need. So I did that for all of the fabrics listed for block number one. This is going to save you a lot of time and headaches when you're cutting out your pieces. This last column is the cutting instructions for each fabric. The very first section here is the background. So if you have pre-cut your background, you already have this done and you can just skip over the top of it. If you have not pre-cut your background, you will need to cut the yardages listed here for your background pieces before you begin. Or if you are using a specialty tool or technique, you will need to cut your background with each block. And so you will use this first section here that's for the background and cut just what's in this box to get everything you need for this block. Each block that we're making for blocks one through four, you're making two blocks at one time. Okay, let's break down how this block is made. The first unit that is in the instruction book is this corner four patch. The pattern has you making the half square triangles in the modern traditional way of using a square drawing the line sewing on both sides splitting it and then pressing it open for having these two pieces when you do that your block looks like this when you go to put the pieces together these two squares were cut at the two and seven eighths sewn quarter inch diagonally on both sides of the line split and pressed open and these measure exactly two and a half inches. These little dog ears are the result of pressing your seams towards the dark side. You can trim them off or you can leave them in your seam allowance. It's up to you. If you like to sew big and trim down, instead of making these two pieces two and seven eighths inches, you would cut them three inches. Do the same step with the sewing on each side of the diagonal line cut and press open, and you end up with this. One of the nice things about this is you know this is exactly two and a half, regardless if you get a little wonky seam allowance in here, because you square this block up, it eliminates the dog ears, and you have a precise measurement to go together with your other squares that are already cut at two and a half. The next step in the instructions is to sew the two at the top together, the two at the bottom together, and then you sew the top and bottom rows together, giving you the unit that goes in this corner right here. You're going to make four of those for this block and eight of them in total to make two block number ones. The next section that we're going to put together is this little intricate double flying geese. Now, if you want to make this flying goose unit, using a particular tool or paper or technique you can do that the size that you want to make is a two and a half by four and a half unfinished so two and a half by four and a half pretty traditional size for flying geese units and you will have to make four of those per block or eight to complete both of the two block number one. For those of you following the pattern as written, let's go over the details of this block. The first thing you're going to cut or already have cut is the background. The background calls for a five and a quarter inch square cut twice diagonally. That is a G triangle in the background. The second piece you have to cut is a two and seven eighths inch square cut in half diagonally. Next, we combine those two elements to make a flying geese unit like this. So this is the old fashioned way of making a flying 
the unit is to take your G triangle and add the B triangles onto the side. I would not recommend trying to cut these large and then cut them down. It's very difficult to get these lined up when they're not the right size. The next step is to add these small triangles here on the side of your flying goose unit. This is another place where you're going to see duplication in the letters. So this is a two and seven eighths inch square cut in half diagonally and added to the sides here. You'll know they're in the right place when you've got a long line for the background. It's very easy to get these in the wrong place. A lot of times I have to double check myself because it's easy to get them put this way. But you want to make sure that they are facing this way. And you have this nice long line across the bottom of the background. These pieces go on very easily. They line up right here both sides line up perfectly and you're going to stitch right along here for the quarter inch seam allowance press these out so the seam allowances presses out towards the triangle once that is completed you're going to add a triangle onto the flying geese and make a nice point this is what we're making right here this again is a piece G. It's made in the same way that you made this triangle and they are labeled the same. This is another place in the pattern where it can get a little confusing. There's multiple piece B's. There's multiple piece G's. Most patterns change every piece to have a different letter. This one, the letters are all the same regardless of print if they're cut in the same manner. I hope that makes sense. It's a little confusing. Just take your time and really look at the patterns and be aware of the letters and the sizes that you're cutting. Once you get that piece on there and all that's left is to add the large triangles along the side. This is made with a four and seven eighths inch square cut diagonally and added to the side. As you can see with all of these parts, after the flying goose unit, all of these parts have to be cut the right size and added on. You can't cut these large and trim down because there's no measurement on these angles to give you. Once you get to here and you sew these on, these lay like this, same way, the point matches, this long side matches, and this bottom matches, nice and square. Sew along here for your quarter inch. I recommend when you're sewing this to sew it from this side. So sew along here using a scant quarter inch so you can really see where your intersection is. This seam allowance and this seam allowance make an X right here. That is the point that you want to meet for your flying goose unit. Now, don't go right through the X. You need to go scant and go right above the X so that you get a really pretty point. Once those triangles are sewn on here, your unit is finished. This unit should measure four and a half by eight and a half unfinished raw cut edge. You need four of these units for one block or eight units for both of the number one block. That now gives you this unit and this unit, which makes up the entire outside of the quilt block. All of the quilt blocks are made the same way. So this will be the only time I go over in detail these outside block edges. From now on, we'll just be going over the centers of each block. And here's what your outside units will look like. You're going to sew this row all together. You're going to leave these for when you make your center unit. And you're going to sew this row all together. And this is what you're going to just set aside for now until you make your center square. Now, the next section that you're going to make is this center square right here. 
And this is broken up into two different blocks. This one and this one. And you're going to make two of this and two of this. The instructions are very clear and you can follow right along here. Now that you know how to read and use the pattern, go ahead and make the center section on your own. I just want to talk to you for a little bit about the applique option. So the only thing that's different, as I mentioned before, is the center. This first section is the fabric required. And I did the same thing as before. I wrote in all my fabric so I knew exactly which ones to collect. And this column details the applique pieces to be cut. And these you don't have to worry about because these are the go cutter dies. So you, unless you're using a go cutter, you can ignore this box right here. If you turn the page, you will see the full size layout of the applique center. These are the pieces you will need to cut to create your applique block. Now, I'm not proficient in applique, so I'm taking this on as a personal challenge to try five different applique techniques to share with you and see what I like best. And maybe you'll take on the challenge as well and learn something new. If you love applique, please leave your notes, suggestions, and tips in the comments so everyone can benefit from your skill set. I have three tips right off the bat that will be beneficial no matter which technique you plan to use. Number one, to help you align the motif in the center of your block, you need to find the center of your background piece. Fold it in half and fold it in half again and give it a light pressing. Don't overpress it because you don't want those lines to be in there permanently but this will give you a chance to have a center and line up your pieces more perfectly. Number two, the instructions have you cut your background applique square to eight and a half inches, which is the size you need for the center of your block. But I recommend that you cut your block to nine and a half inches. This way you have room for correction if your pieces get a little off center or if your background starts to pull a little while you are applying your applique pieces. When you're finished, you can give it a good pressing, center up your motif, and square your block to eight and a half inches for a perfect fit. And number three, lay your background piece on the block layout and take a marker and draw a map of where your pieces will go. Make sure you draw well inside the lines so nothing shows should your applique pieces turn out to be not exactly the right shape or size. I chose my least favorite applique technique first so I could get it out of the way. But many people absolutely love this style, so it might be the one for you. This is Lori Holt's favorite method. She uses a lightweight interfacing put on top of the pattern and trace the shapes or using a template traces around the template you place the interfacing with the line drawn side up on top of the right side of the fabric and then using a small straight stitch stitch around on the line i like to stitch around on the outside of the line because when you turn this, the fabric takes up a little bit more, like a scant quarter inch, except on the outside. After you stitch around, trim and notch where needed. Don't forget to notch on the outside of the curves and just clip on an inside curve. Then you're going to take and split the interfacing and turn the piece right side out. You can use something like a point turner to get in here and get good points and smooth seams. Don't press too hard. You don't want to go through the edges, but you just put a little pressure on the fabric side of the edge and push it out past the interfacing. Once that's done, give it a little press with a hot iron to make it good and flat. 
One of the most popular techniques these days is to use a little Aileen's glue or fabric glue underneath your piece to hold it in place so it doesn't shift when you go to stitch around it. This technique gives each piece a lovely finished edge so you can sew them down by hand or by machine using a straight stitch, a hem stitch, or even a simple zigzag. Or you could use more of a satin stitch like I did here. All that's left is to add your applique center to your block and sew this center row together. Now add the top and the bottom rows and you'll have your full block. I recommend sewing this together by having the row on top of the center. That way you can manage your seam allowances so they don't get twisted and you can aim for this point right here so you end up with a perfect point. And that's it. Look how great this turned out. Now, there's one more step. The last step to finishing this block is to add the background strips around the block so your beautiful points can float away from the sashing strip, like this. And we're done with block number one. You have two of these blocks to make, whether you do the pieced center or the applique center, or one of each, that is up to you. I hope you found this tutorial helpful as you go through the Winter's Garden Block of the Month. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get notified when next month's video gets posted. If you'd like to join our Block of the Month, you can find everything you need in our online store at thequilterscandyshop.com. That's S-H-O-P-P-E shop.com. Now, go sew something sweet. Bye!